So let's uh, begin uh, talking about some announcements. Homework 7 is due the coming Friday, so October 30th at 11.59 p.m. Eastern on Gradescope. Uh, Studio 5, which has three tasks, uh, that is about decoders and encoders, is due tomorrow, Wednesday, October 28th. Both the Gradescope submission and a checkoff from the TAs or undergraduate student assistants is required for a valid Studio 5 submission. Quiz 14 is on Gradescope for you to answer uh, anytime during the day today. All right. Um, regarding the, the, the exam regrades, uh, I have collected them uh, and I will attend to those uh, sometime, uh, maybe today or sometime tomorrow. All right, let's move on. We have been talking about multiplexers. So let's take a look at the general concept of a multiplexer using uh, the context of a commutator. So what we have on the left over here is a multiplexer which could have some enable signal. You could have one of them or many of them. That is a control signal that allows you to enable versus disable a multiplexer. Apart from that, we obviously have, need to have select inputs that are obviously going to select one of the, uh, one from many data inputs. So in this case, we have uh, many data inputs, data sources. So this is going from 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on up to n minus 1. So in total, there are n data sources over here. Each data source does not necessarily have to be one bit each. So over here, each data source is b bits each. And the number of select lines are s. And when, depending on what the select uh, input is, we will select one among D0, D1, D2, and so on, and data sources, and that'll what that's what goes to uh, Y. So Y is our data output. So let me use pink for that. Now, how does this relate to the, the commutator and switch diagram on the right? Where is the enable? Enable is right here. So if you can see, if that is not enabled, then the switch is going to all these switches on the B different lines are going to be all open. That means nothing is going to be connected to the output. How about the output? The output itself is over here. B bit data output, the first bit of Y, the second bit of Y, and so on up to the B bit of Y. All of that combined gives you the B bit data output. And apart from those switches and the output, we also have the, the data sources. Now, if you see, the data sources over here are very nicely bundled up. So, right, D0, all of B bits of D0 are together. All of B bits of D1 are together and so on. But in the commutator diagram, what we see is the first bit of D0, so let me show the first bit of D0, the second bit of D0, the third bit of D0, and so on, the bth bit of D0. They're all broken up. And then, depending on your select line, which is over here, you select one of that bit from D0. So, if select line points to D0, then you pick the first bit here, the second bit here, and the third bit bit here. And that goes through, and if it is enabled, that appears at the output. Now, uh, let us try to build some relationship between B and S. The number of, uh, sorry, we have three variables, right? We have the variable S for number of select lines, and we have B for the number of bits in each data source, and we also have n data sources. 
So can you guys think of any relationship between S, B and N? Not necessarily all of them, but maybe, uh, you know, some of them. So how many bits do you need to select from uh, four data sources? How many select lines would you need to select from four? Two, right? So if you have two uh, select lines, then you can choose from four. Now you have N data sources. How many select lines would you need? All right, perfect. Log N to the base two. So I should have S equals log of N to the base two. You guys agree with that? Because if I have N data sources, then I would need at least, I can also have this to be greater, right? So I can have it greater. Because if I have say uh, four data sources, I can use a minimum of two, but I can also use a, uh, three bits to select from four. So the criteria over here is going to be S should be greater than or equal to log n to the base two. You guys see it? All right, let's move on here. The the multiplexers come in various different, you know what, let me, let me write a few statements here. Uh, S is the number of select lines. And then we have B, which is number of bits per data source. And we have N as number of data sources. All right. Let us move on here. The multiplexers come in uh, various different sizes, like we d discussed in the last class. There can be a two to one mux where you are selecting one from two inputs one from two data sources. Four is to one, you're selecting one from four inputs. Eight is to one marks, you're selecting one from eight inputs and so on. You need one select line for two is to one. You need two select lines for four is to one. You need three select lines from eight is to one and so on. In all these cases, the output Z is going to be one output but it's one output but it could have more bits right so it could have in our previous example our one output had b bits so in general for multiplexers you only have one output but that output could be multiple bit so ajit asks a question so muxes are usually in powers of two absolutely right uh, two is to one four is to one 16 is to one 32 is to one and so on uh, let's see. Now, can you make bigger muxes by using smaller muxes? So, for example, what we have over here is 8 is to 1 mux that is being designed by cascading smaller muxes. So, 8 is to 1 mux being designed using two 4 is to 1 muxes and one 2 is to 1 mux. So essentially what you're doing is you have it in, in split up into two stages. The first stage is when you select one from top four, one from bottom four inputs. And then your second stage is select one from the selected top input and select or you select the bottom one, right? So it's like a... Uh, you have divided the field into two and then you have divided that into two again, right? That's how you can select one from eight. 
So what we'll do over here is we'll consider a simple example. Let's say we have uh, ABC. Let me put ABC as some arbitrary sequence. Can you guys pick three numbers for any like a uh, arbitrary ABC? Oh, ones or zeros? No, 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 no. So ABC are three inputs. They are binary. One, zero, one. That, that will work. Uh, hold up. Uh, let's see. So I'm going to take the first uh, one that is was valid. One one zero will work, right? That is for A, B, and C. All right, one one zero. One here, one here, and zero here. <laughs> so if it is one one and zero, I've got one over here, right? And then B is also one, and C is zero. Now, if you see this, B is connected to the most significant select for both the 4 is to 1 muxes. And C is connected to the least significant select for both the muxes. So the question is, what is going to be selected from the top mux and what is going to be selected from the bottom mux? B is 1, 0. B is 1 and C is 0. So if B is 1, C is 0, you are essentially assigning one here and a zero there, and a one there and a zero there. So out of these four, which one will go through? I one, right? Because one zero, the least, uh, I one, no, I two, right? So zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. So we have this situation here. 1, 0. So I2 is going to go through, right? So I2 goes through here and it is available there. Yes, B is, B is most significant in, in that case. Yes. Uh, how about the other one? Which of the other four inputs will go through? You have I4, I5, I6, I7. I6 will go through, yes. So if I6 will go through, I6 is going to be available over here. Now you select at the end. What do you select at the end for Z? Given A is 1. I6 again. You see it? So you divided the field in half here, half here, and then you selected 1 from that. And it turns out that ABC110 is the same as what you selected, I6. So you could arrange muxes uh, in a cascaded fashion to big build bigger muxes. All right. Now we have a slightly overwhelming diagram, but if you if we start looking at what it is actually doing it's not that uh, it's not that complicated it actually turns out to be very simple all it is doing is it is a 8 to 1 mux that is it in a standard chip which is 74x151 so let's talk about the inputs and outputs first in terms of input what do we have here enable underscore l so we have got a active low enable signal that is being used uh, active low enable right active low enable that is being used for the entire chip right here next we have d0 all the way to d7 what are they they are eight data sources and they are all one bit long right so let me highlight them here and say these guys are going to be uh, eight data sources one bit right they are not multiple bit each it's just one bit how do i know that because they are going as one input 
to the AND gate that is over there. So it cannot be more than one bit. So you have got eight data sources and obviously to select one from eight, you need three select lines. I've got three select lines right here. Three active high select lines. Now the, the question <clears throat> is, which one is going to be the most significant select? Which one is going to be the least significant select? Let me also map them onto the chip as well. ABC is right there and D0 to D7 is over there. And then depending on what the select lines are going to be, we are going to have Y and Y complement equal to that. Um, also something to note is the outputs are available in true as well as in complemented form. You see that Y is available and Y complement is also available. So output over here is available in true and complemented form. So that's your outputs here. All right, so I think in terms of all the inputs and outputs, we have, we have uh, figured that out. We have uh, mapped them to the chip as well. Now let us simply try to write the outputs of the AND gates, right? So if I was trying to write the outputs of the AND gates, what I mean by that is I'm trying to write an expression here and maybe over here. And once I do that for a couple of them, I will know what the pattern is going to be going down. So let me try to write it for the top one first. What do I have? D0, right? D0 is one of the inputs. Uh, let me highlight that. Uh, small one, yellow is fine. That, that is D0. How about the next one? The next input is coming from one of the blue lines. That is going to be your A complement. D0 and A complement. And what else? Uh, another blue line. Track it down. All the way down here. So what is that? Again, B complement. The last one. C complement. Oh, oh. All right. Hold up, guys. Uh, where did I miss this? Fall. All right. That was C complement. And then we, of course, want it enabled. So I'm also going to write uh, a one here. If I make this guy a zero, that will be a one. So I have enabled the chip as well. So that's my top most, um, top most output of the AND gate. So depending on what A, B, C are going to be, I will have that go into the NOR gate. Once you go into the NOR gate, you have the uh, active low output as Y underscore L, and then you invert it again to get your true output Y. So for example, if A is going to be zero, and B is going to be zero, and C is going to be zero, you are essentially going to get Y equals D zero. And Y underscore L will be D zero complement. And I'm able to say that because what is going to happen is when A is zero, B is zero, C is zero, only A complement, B complement, C complement will be ones. Everything else, all the outputs of the other AND gates will give you a zero. That's why. And you can, you can quickly verify that. So for example, if you go down one level, try to find the uh, expression here, what, what are you going to get? You are simply going to get D, uh, let me write it in red here. Uh, we are going to get D1 ended with A, ended with B complement, ended with C complement, and one, enabled. 
So you can see that if A was zero, this output would have canceled out. And that's what you would have gotten for the output eventually. Now with this, you can also talk about which one is the most significant and which one is the least significant. Can you guys tell me just by looking at uh, these two expressions, which select input is least significant and which one is most significant? So Ian says A is, A is least significant. That's absolutely right because that is what is changing the fastest. If it is changing the fastest, that means it's going to be least significant. So you're absolutely right. A is the least significant input, select input. So you have A as the least significant select input and B, uh, C is going to be the most significant select input. All right, so with this background, let us try to answer this. This guy is zero. This guy is one, one, zero. What do you, and all of this is say, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W. What do you get here? So I've given you all the input combinations and I'm just asking you what is going to be Y and Y complement. R and R complement. Okay. Let us try to verify. It is enabled. So I don't need to worry about that anymore. I know that A, B, C are select lines. So A is least significant. Yes, A is least significant. So I'm going to need to write this as 0, 1, 1, right? So zero one one is actually three. So it should be D three. So that should be S and this should be S complement. That's right. All right, so I hope uh, you found that example uh, useful and we can now move on. Now, another uh, chip that we can learn quickly about is the 74X157, which is a two input MUX. So you're essentially selecting one from two inputs, but each of those inputs is a four bit input. So essentially what that means is this guy is four bits and this guy is four bits too. And of course that has to be four bits as well. So to select between two inputs, you only need one select line. So this is your select line S. The, the, out, the inputs are called D0 and D1. D0 here and D1 here. And the output is called Y. There is also an enable signal. So enable underscore L, for example. So let me sketch that in black. an active low enable. So what happens here is, if enable is one, active low enable, and it is high right now, so it is disabled. If the chip is disabled, no matter what the select input is going to be, all the output four bits are going to be zero. If it is disabled. And if it is enabled for the next two cases, then if S is zero, essentially you're talking about this case, this guy going through, right? Uh, maybe use a different line there and there. So if S is zero, we have got the case outputs are going to equal the first uh, 1D0, 2D0, 3D0, 4D0. What do those mean? First bit of D0, second bit of D0, third bit of D0, fourth bit of D0 will go through to Y. 
and that's what will equal the first bit of output second bit of output third bit of output and fourth bit of output and then when it is enabled and the select line is one then d1 will go through to the output the four bits of the d1 will map to four bits of y so that could also be possible uh, in a multiplexer where each of the inputs are multiple bit so that's your 74x154 two inputs and each of the input is four bit all right questions about this All right, let's move on and take a look at this 74X157, the same chip that we talked about, but all the internals of it, right? So we are trying to uh, look at what is inside this particular chip. Uh, one active low enable, one select line, two four bit inputs and one four bit output. So let us try to uh, look at this by uh, assuming certain input conditions, right? So let us suppose that we have our enable signal active. So let's make this zero. The moment we make that zero, that will become a one. And for the select line, obviously this guy could be a zero, could be a one. If you want to select D0, it should be a zero. If you want to select D1, it should be a one. So let us start with zero. So if this guy is a zero as well, that is a one there and one and one will give you a one there. How about the next uh, AND gate? That zero will have a one there, which means that's going to be a zero there. And I don't even need to look at the other input, but the other input is one here. It's going to be a zero there. So the moment you see the outputs here as one and zero, you can essentially cancel some things out. So for example, uh, the zero input is going to this, to this, to this, and to this. So the moment you have that as zero, and because it is feeding to AND gates, this will cancel out, this will cancel out, this will cancel out, and this will cancel out. What does cancel out mean? Cancel out means that the output of this guy is going to be zero, regardless of the other input. And then the other case is uh, this guy is one there. So there's a one there, there's a one there, there's a one there, there's a one here. So let's try to write the output here. What is the output here? You guys tell me what the output here is. One D zero, right. 1d0 similarly this guy is going to be 2d0 this guy is going to be 3d0 and this guy is going to be 4d0 and they are all going through OR gates 4 OR gates which means 1d0 OR0 is going to be 1d0 here 2d0 here 3d0 here and 4d0 here so that's exactly what we need. We need when S is zero, you should get D zero correspond to the output Y. That's exactly what we got. Now, if you switch this to a one, if you switch, switch S to a one, the reverse will happen. So the, the AND gates, which were giving 1D0, 2D0, and so on, they will all become disabled, meaning they will all output a zero. The other AND gates, which had a X on them, those will output 1D1, 1D1, 2D1, 3D1, 4D1, and that's what will drive the outputs of the chip. Questions here?
All right. Now let us talk about a very, very interesting aspect of multiplexer design, which is to synthesize logic functions using MUXs. What I have to begin with is a sum of product, canonical sum of product uh, function, F. It has three inputs, A, B, C. A, of course, is the most significant input here. C is the least significant input here. And the min terms that I have are 0, 1, 3, and 7. Right. So this is my most significant input here. This is my least significant input here. And these guys are my min terms. Min term 0 plus min term 1 plus min term 3 plus min term 7 makes it f, function f. Now the example that we are doing right now is how do you synthesize f using an 8 is to 1 mux. And this, this is going to be very, very easy to do. So what I did is I have written up a truth table for f in which I considered a as most significant and c as least significant. I have filled it up with 0, 0, 0 all the way to 1, 1, 1. Now, depending on the min terms, I'm essentially going to fill out the output f as well. So let me do that. I had 0, 1, 3, and 7, right? So 0, 1, 3, and 7 are going to map to 0, 1, 3, and 7. And everything else should be a 0. So 0 here, 0 here, 0 here, 0 here. You guys agree with the truth table? Now, let us see what happens if I choose the select inputs exactly in the same order as my inputs to the function. So what happens, let us see what happens if I connect A, B, C over here. Those are my three select lines and I have connected them directly to A, B and C. And this is my S2. S1, S0. So I've connected the most significant select to A, the least significant select to the input C. And what I'm simply going to do is, I'm simply going to take my function F, copy it from here and paste it over there. And I'm going to, I'm claiming that my function f is done. I have synthesized it. Now, I cannot just claim this and then just move over. Let me just try to check whether this works or not. What is going to happen if, say, for example, c is 0? Uh, let, let me check it differently, slightly differently. Uh, let me see. This is a A2 is to 1 mux. And let us uh, check this by checking for what is going to happen if A is 1, B is 0, and C is 0. What is F going to be? So A is 1, S2 is 1, S1 is 0, S0 is 0. So this maps to which case? It maps to this case, right? And that means this guy will go through to F. So F is going to be 0. Is it the case? Let us just check. It is exactly the case. That's exactly what we wanted. When A is 1, B is 0, C is 0, we wanted F to be 0. And that's what we got. And similarly, you can check for all the other 
cases, all the other seven cases, and it will match up exactly the way it is supposed to. All right, so if I have a three input situation, and if I'm asked to synthesize that function using eight is to one marks, all I need to do is take the output of the truth table, put it as the inputs, the eight inputs, the inputs to the function itself being used as select lines, and then the output of the function is the output of the marks, as simple as that. Now, the next exercise we will do is, we will try to synthesize the same expression, but in this case, we are going to synthesize it using a two is to one marks instead of a eight is to one marks. Uh, there's a question over here. For all the eight inputs in the marks, do we name them D0, D1, or do we just refer them as zeros and ones? So if in the truth table you have D0, D1, D2, then you have to call them D0, D1, D2, and so on. But in this case, because our function was defined clearly, we had we were able to do it as zeros and ones. So we, in this case, we can do, write them as zeros and ones. But for some other function, if they have been left as variables, then you would need to connect them as variables. All right, let's come back to this example here. Synthesize the same function as before, but in this case, use a two is to one marks. So what we are going to do here is use Shannon's expansion theorem. So first step I'm going to do is to explicitly write out the canonical sum of product expression. So what is going to be the canonical sum of product expression for F? f equals i've got a min term 0 min term 1 min term 3 min term 7 so what i'll do first is i will simply write a b c or a b c or a b c or a b c then i will say the first min term is 0 so bar 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 and then this next one is 1 so bar, bar here, and then three, zero, one, one, and then the last one is just seven, one, one, one. So if that is the canonical sum of a product complete expression for F, how can I apply Shannon's expansion theorem on this? So the first question you need to ask is, for a two is to one marks, how many select, how many select do you need one how many choices do you have well over here you have a choice of a being used as select b being used as select c being used as select so you have three choices and you have to select one from those three choices to be used as a select input so i'll open up the choice to you guys. Select one from A, B, or C. Pick one as the select variable. <laughs> A, we, I cannot do all three guys. So somebody picked A. Let's do A first. Whoever did it first, I picked that. A. Uh, so the second step is to pick one as select. And Daniel picked A. Now, once this step is done, the most crucial step happens. We are going to try to rewrite the same expression F, but in this form. I'm going to write A complement here. or a over here so essentially i am expanding this function 
with respect to A. But I have to make sure that this guy matches this guy exactly. My goal is to figure out what goes here and what goes here. In order for them to match, let us try to work on the first question mark. What should go here in order for those two expressions to match? Well, it is quite simple. You will try to first look at where is a complement so that you can factorize. Well, there is an a complement. You're looking for a complement, right? So there's a complement there, there's a complement there, there's a complement there. There's no a complement there. So what would I need to write over here? Well, I would need to write in the uh, brackets, the square brackets, I would need to write uh, B complement and C complement or B complement and C or B and C. And then what is left over? It has A, right? So this guy has A. So for the second bracket, I don't need to do anything. I can simply write uh, B and C. So B complement, C complement, plus B complement, C, and B, oh, yes, you got it. And then for the second one, you got just B and C. So I hope you guys are okay with the manipulation so far. The next thing that you need to check is simplification. Can you simplify this? No, you can't. B and C, that's it. You can't simplify this anymore. So we are ready with that part. Where is that going to go? This actually becomes your bottom input to the monks. Next, can you simplify this? Yes. So where should we simplify? Maybe on the next page, because I think it's going to be a little bit of work. Let's try to simplify this. So right away, I can see uh, that the second and the third term are uh, having C as common thing. So I leave B complement here, C complement there, and then I will pull out a C from the next two terms, which will give me B complement or B, which is going to be equal to one. So I've got B complement and C complement or C. You guys okay with this so far? Next. I can actually write this as C or B complement. 11D. 11D, property 11D says X or X complement Y equals X or Y. You can check this. So by using this 11D property, what I did was simplified B complement and C complement or C to C or B complement. You can check this later. But my claim is that this expression is going to simplify to B complement or C. That's it. So the simplification was yes and it simplified to B complement or C uh, or C and that is going to become my top input. So you see now how I'm going to synthesize this using the two is to one marks. What, what did Daniel pick for the select variable A? So that's what is going to go here as the select input. S. 
when s is 0 what happens when s is 1 what happens when s is 0 that means a is 0 you need to have b complement or c go in there and then for the next one the bottom input you you had what b and c there and this is f you guys see it Uh, let me use maybe black here that went to that and then this guy went here I can actually check this right I can check this very quickly uh, how can I check this I'm going to copy this design here and I'm going to paste it here and say this is for checking so for checking let's see uh, a equals 0 what is f when a is 0 what is f supposed to be exactly right not b or c right so i can quickly make a table here uh what saying that uh, when a is zero oh i don't need to uh, 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 when a is zero f should be b complement or c right so let's see if i go back all the way here where is f zero f is zero for these four cases the first four right and when f is 0 is f b complement or c let's check it b complement would give me one here there it is b complement would give me one here there it is b complement would give me zero here c is zero so i got a zero there one here one here b complement is zero but c is one so f is one right so all of this is exactly correct and we can actually look at the other one as well when a was one uh, i want this to be square When a was 1, you see your, your 1 is over here for f. So f is what? b and c. Would this method also work if you put f in POS form? No. So for um, the design with muxes, I would recommend that you convert everything to SOP and work from there. So you can essentially check it, right? That's what we did here. Satisfies truth table. Now some people, uh, you know, leave the expression like this, but you know, if you were asked to design the complete logic diagram, uh, I would recommend you to do something like that. Uh, come bring in that and then go here. something like that and then and gate something like that so you've got three inputs a b and c one output f but you have designed this using a two is to one marks and one not gate one and gate one or gate All right now we can expand on this because what we had is function three inputs synthesized using eight is to one mux same function three inputs synthesized using two is to one mux so the obvious next choice is same function four is to one mux 
So what we are going to do is our first step remains as is. Actually, let me copy this. Uh, all right. Let us give somebody else a chance here. Uh, Arham says C. <laughs> Alright, if you pick C, you need to start with C complement and C. And then you need to figure out what this is. Right, so what are they going to be? Very quickly we can find that out. Where is a C? Uh, there is a C there, there is a C there, there is a C there as well. Right, so all those three terms will go left. So what do you have? A complement, B complement, or A complement, B, or A and B, right? All the three things that are highlighted in yellow go there. And there is only one term that has a C complement in there. Oh, oh, hold up. What did I do? Mm, C complement, I, I reversed it. Yes, a complement and uh, yes. There's only one term that has a, let me use the same colors. And then for yellow, the first term, C complement, what is that? A complement and B complement, right? Now, once I have this step, I'm going to try to do the same step within this step. So expand again, right? Pick another. Uh, what is left? C is taken, so you're left with A and B as next most significant all right Ian says a but Muhammad's uh, <laughs> all right I appreciate you guys so in order to stay consistent I'm going to uh, pick copy here I don't think I'll have space remaining, so I'll paste it here. So let's go with uh, A, right? Okay, A. So I have F. Inside C complement, if I pick A complement, I'm doing this. And then for C again, maybe color coding will work. I'm picking the same variable A again. Now my goal is for these guys to match, right? The yellow shaded one and the blue shaded one, they all have to match exactly. 
So what should I fill? What should I fill in over here? B complement is absolutely right. If I make it B complement, it matches the expression. What about over here? Zero. That's good. All right, let's move on here. What should I fill there? Not B. Right. So B or not B. What is that? One. Yes. And then the last one. B. Perfect. And that's it. Uh, I have C as my most significant select. I have A as my least significant select. And my four inputs are B complement, 0, 1, and B. B complement, 0, 1, and B. My most significant select was C. And my least significant select was A. This is my F. S1, S0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. There it is. The same function synthesized using a 4 is to 1 max and very, very like arbitrary choices. You can see we selected C first as our most significant select, then A. Now you can test, test this again, right? So when you say C equals 1, A equals 0, what should F be? One. Right? Is it? When C is zero, when C is one, A is zero, is it, is the function a, a one or not? How can you find that out? C is 1, A is 0. Where is C 1 and A 0? C is 1, A is 0 right here. And F is 1 there. Uh, C is 1 right here. F is 1. Right? It's independent of B. So you can check similar things for all the other cases uh, in order to verify your work. So the variable you choose first will be the most significant select. Yes. So in this case, uh, C became the most significant because it was picked first and then you expanded with respect to A so that A became the next uh, significant select. All right, questions about this guys. you can take absolutely any function and apply this method on it to synthesize it using uh, muxes just the you only need to ask how many inputs are there if you have a case where you have three inputs then you would need eight is to one mux or four is to one mux or two is to one mux you cannot do it well you can you can still do it with 16 to one marks but many of the inputs will go unused so it's not very efficient
all right let's move on here let us do something uh, very re uh, uh, related to this we are going to try to implement an AND gate a two input AND gate using a two is to one mux so how can we do this so first we start off with an expression right so what is the expression expression is f equals a and b and we are using Shannon's expansion theorem for this. So who wants to select the variable, the select variable? Michael says A, all right, Bade also says A, very nice. So if I expand using A, then I need to write it as this. So what goes here and what goes here? Zero and B, perfect. Done. You guys see it? Very simple and you know, uh, very quick as well. Questions about this example? Okay, now I want to uh, revisit something that we did earlier. You see over here, we were trying to expand using A and when we did that, there was a term with A complement. There were actually two terms with A complement and there was a term with uh, a as well what if what if we did not have this term what would you do uh, so suppose we had something like this right so let me copy this guy from here and let us paste it over here and erase this erase this Yes. What if we had to expand that uh, with respect to A? What would you put over here? And here. The first thing is pretty simple, right? A complement is there is a B complement there, there is a B there, right? So that's already one. But what do you do with this? It doesn't have A complement, it doesn't have A, so where should it go? Add B to both, perfect. Because you can always write B as A complement B or A and B, right? So it goes in both. Yes. So there, this B actually goes here as well as here. This will still be one, but over here you get a B. So if there is a term that does not have the expansion variable, it will go in both. Yes, multiply by A or A complement. You guys see it? So some sometimes that might happen as well. So if you have a term that does not have the expansion variable, you just simply put it in both the term, both the top and the bottom inputs. So let me kind of separate this out and let's move on. Okay, so the summary of muxes. Uh, I thought each term was already in the canonical sum of product form. So uh, it could occur after, right? So it could occur 
So things over here are in canonical form. But once you start expanding them over here, they are no longer in canonical form, right? With respect to ABC, they are still not in canonical form. And sometimes that happens. So when you when you do the homework problems with uh, uh, with muxes, uh, you will uh, face situations where uh, you know the term that you are trying to expand with respect to you, that might not be there, and if that is the case, you just put it in both. All right, let's move on. So a summary of muxes: uh, these are simply data switches. So we are selecting uh, one from many and each of those data inputs could be one or more bits. Uh, they, are, they route incoming data to a selected output. They can realize any arbitrary logic function. We looked at that in the context of Shannon's expansion theorem. And now we will start talking about demuxes, which do exactly the opposite of muxes. So these are going to distribute data from one source to n outputs. They can also switch more than one bit. So let's take a look at demux, exactly the opposite of mux. So what we are going to have here is a situation where you have single data inputs and control or select inputs and two raised to n outputs. So what I'll do is I'll try to consider like a simple demux uh, diagram and then we, we can talk about This has forgotten how to write. Say we have a one is to four case. For one is to four case, we still need two select lines. Let me call those select lines S1 and S0. I have my input as I. I have my output as O0, O1, uh, let me not do O, let me use Y. Y0, Y1, Y2, Y3. This is a 1 is to 4 demux. So the, the, the way it should operate is, if S1 and S0 are 0, 0, then y0 should equal i and if s1 and s0 are 0 1 y1 should equal that input s1 s0 are 1 1 uh, sorry 1 0 y2 should equal i and s1 and s0 are 0 0 y3 should equal i what is going on? All right, so very similar to the marks, right? You still have the select lines, but now it is trying to use the select lines to route the input, one input to one of the many outputs. Right. So it is sort of one to many mapping and which it goes to which output line it goes through that depends on the select lines, exactly the opposite of the mux operation. So let us try to see if we can find out what goes inside this demux design. So essentially a logic diagram that can implement these four statements. And it's actually quite simple. It is just based off of, uh, let me erase this. It is simply based off of four AND gates. The inputs to the first AND gates are S1 complement, S0 complement, S1 complement, S0 complement, S1 and S0 complement, S1 and S0. Four AND gates for the four is to, uh, one is to four DMUX. Each of these AND gates has an input of I. And my claim is that if you do this, you get y0 here, y1 here, y2 here, and y3 here. So let us try to see what happens 
uh, let us try to pick s1 as 0 and s0 as 0 let's try to check what happens to y0 in this case the moment you have s1 is 0 s uh, s0 is 0 you have one there one there right and then you have a uh, one there and a zero there you have a zero there and a one there and you have a zero there and a zero there so right away you know that this is going to be zero this is going to be zero you have this is going to be zero and this is going to be i right so you know that's that's uh, that's how you uh, implement uh, Four, uh, 1 is to 4 DMUX with two select inputs. So in this case, you have one data input uh, and many data outputs. Now, if we can see the MUX and DMUX together, you can actually use a multiplexer along with a demultiplexer in a routing application. So what you can do is you can have a source select control lines to select one among many sources. So that would be a MUX. The data itself goes on to a bus, to a receiver, for example. And over here, it needs to get routed to one of the many destinations, right? So you can, you can, you can have a DMUX over there. Now, in terms of a block diagram, you can represent that as a MUX connected to a DMUX using a bus. So, for example, uh, let me represent things in binary. Uh, let me see uh, what happens if you have source select as, oh my gosh. In decimal, you have five here. In decimal, you have uh, two there. So if I set it up like this, can you guys tell me which source goes to which destination? Five is essentially the decimal equivalent of the se source select lines. F goes to C. Uh, okay, very close. Five. It starts with A. Uh, one, two, three. F goes to C actually is good. So here, five, right? So this is zero, one, two. D would be three. E would be four. And F would be five. Right? So F would get selected from here. And it would go to 0, 1, and 2. C. Right? Source F would go to destination C. Because I started, so I start with 0, right? Because I said this is a decimal equivalent. So I need to also consider 0, 0. Now let us, let us take a look at this. Uh, how many select lines would you need? How many select how many bits of select lines uh, log two to the base z okay that works <laughs> what is that though can four work can five work should be five right yes because i need at least 32 i have until 26 so I at least need five bits to do the select. So essentially what we have here is a, a routing application where any source can be routed to any destination. Select one among the source, go through the bus and then um, go to one of the destinations. Now you can actually uh, you know, put some more complexity into this. You can say each of these sources could be 
multiple bit as well, right? So each of these sources could be two bits each or four bits each because yeah, they are connected using a bus. So that bus could be two bits, four bits, whatever size, right? So this application can also work for the case where each of the sources is multiple bit. In this case, it is just being shown for um, one bit, but you could have a situation with multiple bits. Okay. Now let us try to see if we can synthesize a D DMUX using a three to eight binary decoder. So we are going to try to see if we can synthesize a eight output DMUX using a three to eight binary decoder. Now you see this, this is seven, four X one, three, eight. So that's your, uh, what is that? That's your three to eight decoder, right? You have got your three active high inputs and you have got your eight active low outputs, three to eight decoder. Now the question is, can I use this to synthesize a D multiplexer? Question one, what is happening with the enables? G1 is connected to high, so it's good. G2, an active low enable, is connected to ground. So that's good as well. So these two guys are enabled. And G2A, which is an active low enable, is actually connected to the source data. So this could be a zero or it could be a one. Now, if it is a zero, actually, let me put uh, this guy in black and this guy in maybe red. If the source data underscore L is one, what happens to the outputs? They are all, oh no, they are not high impedance. So the high impedance thing comes into the picture only with the tri-state buffers. They're all one, right? They're all one. So there's a one there. They're all one. And it's actually doesn't matter on the, on the ABC, the, the destination select lines. It doesn't even matter. If one is the input there, they're all going to be one at the output because they're all inactive, right? You see, if one, that's a active low enable. So I actually disabled it. So if I disable the chip, all my outputs are going to be disabled. So they're all going to be one. But the point I'm trying to make is one makes the outputs one. How about zero? If this was zero, what would happen then? Then you need to say, all right, now it is going to be enabled and I need to give it uh, ABC. So for ABC, I will say one, one, zero. So if ABC is one, one, zero, can you tell me what is going to happen to the outputs? Y3 or Y6. Okay. So there, there's already a confusion. Uh, there's already a debate there. Y3 or Y6. So A happens to be the least significant, right? Because you see this number zero. So you need to read this number as zero one one, right? Because it's A is the least significant based on the numbering scheme. So Y three is looking good. Y three goes to zero and everything else is going to be one. Now you see, what did we do? When we had the input as zero, the output became a zero, depending on the select lines. And when the input was one, the output was a one. It, that didn't depend on the input line, but it was. So these are essentially going to function as select for DMUX this is going to function as 
data in and this is going to function as many outputs you can see that so the data is actually going on the go pin which is the g2a pin all right questions about this Stop recording.